Well, shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. And thank you, Hannah, for the beautiful music. As always, that was that was beautiful. That was amazing. Very peaceful. Thank you for blessing us. Okay, tonight we are in for a very interesting live stream. I've got a couple comments that I'd like to respond to. Uh, some of these comments that I've received uh, over the past little while. If I left a reply to your comment saying that I will read and respond to you uh, to your uh, to your comments, I will do that just after um, after I uh, read Josephus. Okay, so we're gonna read Josephus tonight. We're gonna we're gonna finish the chapter that we started last night, and uh, of course we got Q and A uh, and the live fellowship and the comments that I that I'm going to be responding to as well. All right. So if you know of anybody that'd be interested in tuning in, I'm going to be talking about uh, the New Testament in general, uh, where it. Uh, uh, where it stands in, in regards to the things of Scripture. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, Original Sin. we got Soldier of Yahweh I see in the live chat. I'm going to be talking about that as well. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the quote-unquote Old Testament Bible canon, of course, all of that good stuff. So we got lots of... Lots to uh, t to talk about tonight. So if you know of anybody that would be interested in listening to uh, to this live stream, uh, feel free to send them a link, share the live stream, and we will uh, we will get into it. We will get into it. Uh, if you have any questions in the those of you who are listening to this, if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the live chat. Any prayer requests, feel free to drop those in the live chat as well. We'll get to those ASAP. All right, all right. Well, welcome everyone. Blessings, blessings multiplied to you. Speaking of the live chat, let's see what we got here. Kalamantos says shalom to all. Shalom, Kalamantos. Welcome and blessings. Randy says shalom. Shalom, Randy. Welcome and blessings multiplied to you and your family. Voice of One over on TikTok. Welcome. Good to see you. Blessings, blessings. Soldier of Yahweh says hello, everyone. Hello, Soldier of Yahweh. Welcome and blessings multiplied to you as well. The real Bobby Muir says, Amen. All right. Well, good to see you. Welcome. Blessings. Sean says, Shalom all. Shalom, Sean. Welcome. Good to see you. Blessings multiplied to you. And Seek the Lord says, Shalom. Shalom, Seek the Lord. Welcome and blessings multiplied to you. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do here, I am going to read from Josephus. There is... A, um, a conversation that I've been having with a particular person in the comment section, and um, I'm going to send I'm going to send him a message right now to let him know I will be uh, responding to his comment uh, after the reading uh, of the of um, Josephus. Just give me a second, guys. Okay, so we are on Josephus, Flavius Josephus. This will be Flavius Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 15, Chapter 8, Paragraph 3. When therefore Herod had thus got clear of the multitude and had dissipated the vehemency of passion under which they had been, the greatest, the greatest part of the people were disposed to change their conduct and not to be displeased at him any longer. But still, some of them continued in their displeasure against him for his introduction of new, t new customs and esteemed the violation of their laws, of the laws of, of their country as likely to be the origin of very great, great mischiefs to them so that they deemed it an instance of piety rather to hazard themselves to be put to death than to seem as if they took no notice of Herod, who upon 
the change he had made in their government introduced such, such customs in that in a violent matter, manner, excuse me, which they had never been used to before, as indeed in pretense a king, but but in reality one that showed himself an enemy to the whole nation, on which account ten men that were citizens of Jerusalem conspired together against him and swear to one another to undergo any dangers in the attempt and took daggers with them under their garments for the purpose of killing Herod. Now, there was a certain blind man among the conspirators who had thus sworn to one another, on account of the indignation he had against what he heard to, to have been done. He was not indeed able to afford the rest any assistance in the undertaking, but was ready to undergo any suffering with them, if so be they should, should come to any harm, insomuch that he became a, great, a very great encourager of the rest of the undertakers. Paragraph 4. When they had taken this resolution, and that by common consent, they went into the theater, hoping that, in the first place, Herod himself could not escape them, as they should fall upon him so unexpectedly. And supposing, however, that if they missed him, they should kill a great many of those that were about him in this resolution they took though they should die for it, in order to suggest to the king what injuries he had done to the multitude. These conspirators, therefore, standing thus prepared beforehand, went about their design with, with great alacrity. But there was one of those spies of Herod that were appointed for such purposes, to fish out and inform him of any conspiracies that should be made against him, who found who found out the whole affair and told the king of it as he was about to go into the theater. So when he reflected on the hatred which he knew the greatest part of the people bore him and on the disturbances that arose upon every occasion, accordingly he retired into his palace and called those that were accused of this conspiracy before him by, the, by their several names and as upon the guards falling upon them, they were caught in the very act, and knew they could not escape. They prepared themselves for their ends with all the decency they could, and so as not at all to recede from their resolute behavior, for they showed no shame for what they were about, nor denied it. But when they were seized, they showed their daggers, and professed that the conspiracy they had sworn they had sworn to was a holy and pious action that what they intended to do was not for gain or out of any indulgence to their passions but principally for those common customs of their country which all the jews were obliged to observe or to die for them this was what these men said out of their undaunted courage in this conspiracy so they were led away to execution by the king's guards that stood about them and patiently underwent all the torments inflicted on them till they died. Nor was it long before that spy who had discovered them was seized, was seized on by some of the people out of the hatred they bore to him and was not only slain by them but pulled to pieces limb by limb and given to the dogs. This execution was seen by many of the citizens, yet would not one of them discover the doers of it, till upon Herod's making a strict scrutiny after them by bitter and severe tortures, certain women that were tortured confessed what they had seen done. The authors of which fact were so terribly punished by the king that their entire families were destroyed for this their rash attempt. Yet, did not the obstinacy of the people and that undaunted constancy they showed in the defense of their laws make, make Herod any easier to them, but he still strengthened himself after a more secure manner. 
and resolved to encompass the multitude every way, lest such innovations should end in, any, in an uh, open rebellion. Paragraph 5. Since, therefore, he had now in the city fortified by the palace in which he lived, and by the temple which had a strong fortress by it, called Antonia, and was rebuilt by himself, he contrived to make Samaria a fortress for himself also against all the people, and called it Sebaste, supposing that this place would be a stronghold against the country, not inferior to the former. So he fortified that place, which was a day's journey distant from Jerusalem, and which would be useful to him in common to keep both the country and the city in awe. He also built another fortress for the whole nation. It was of old called Strato's Tower, but was by him named Caesarea. Moreover, he chose out some select horsemen and placed them in the great plain, and built for them a place in Galilee called Gaba with Hesabonitis in Perea. And these were the places which he particularly built while he always was inventing somewhat further for his own security and encompassing the whole nation with his guards that they might by no means get from under his power nor fall into tumults which they did continually upon any small commotion, and that if they, if they did make any commotions, he might know of it, while some of his spies might be upon them from the neighborhood and might both be able to know what they were attempting and to prevent it. And when he went about building the wall of Samaria, he contrived to bring there many of those that had been assisting to him in his wars, and many of the people in that neighborhood also, whom he made fellow citizens with the rest. This he did out of, an, out of an ambitious desire of building a temple and out of a desire to make the city more eminent than it had been before, but principally because he contrived that it might at once be for his own security and a monument of his magnificence. He also changed its name and called it Sebaste. Moreover, he parted, in, he parted the adjoining country, which was excellent in its kind among the inhabitants of Samaria, that they might be in a happy condition upon their first coming, in, into, or coming to inhabit. Besides all which he encompassed the city with a great wall of great strength and made use of the acclivity of the place for making its fortification stronger. Nor was the compass of the place made now so small as it, has, as it had been before, but was such as rendered it not inferior to the most famous cities, for it was twenty furlongs in circumference. Now within and about the middle of it, he built a sacred place of a furlong and a half in circuit and adjoined it with all sorts of decorations, and therein erected a temple, which was illustrious on account of both its largeness and beauty. And as to the several parts of the city, he adorned them with decorations of all sorts also. And as to what was necessary to provide for his own security, he made the walls very strong for that purpose, and made it for the greatest part uh, a citadel. And as to the elegance of the building, it was taken care of also, that he might leave monuments of the finest of his, of his taste and of his beneficence to future ages. All right, so Lord willing, uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow be an heir of Shabbat again already. Tomorrow we will read chapter 9 concerning the famine that happened in Judea and Samaria and how Herod, after he had married another wife, rebuilt Caesarea and other Grecian cities. All right, all right. So yes, uh, this coming Saturday, this coming Shabbat, we will be uh, going live at 2 p.m. Eastern, as we always have. We'll have the band, the live band, Lord willing. 
And also, I, uh, I, I will be talking about humility. I think it's very, very important to, uh, to talk about humility. All right, all right. Going nowhere says, hate to burn you guys with bad news all the time, but this is something that's been bothering me for a while now. I think I might be going blind. I'm starting to experience dimness of vision. The thing is going, the thing with going blind, it's usually a slow process. It doesn't happen overnight, but I would be thankful if you could pray for my eyesight in, in the hopes that it doesn't get any worse. And again, sorry for always spouting negativity and the wall of text life's been rough lately too many problems with with no apparent solutions i just can't seem to catch a break no need to apologize going nowhere it's a privilege to pray for you and uh, i appreciate uh, i appreciate your your requests so i know we have different people people listening from uh, to this uh, live stream from all kinds of different platforms so if you're listening on or wherever you're listening on if you're listening on any platform going nowhere right now uh, this is on youtube so everyone everywhere let's join together for this dear brother going nowhere going nowhere I, by the way i i i uh i appreciate uh your fellowship i appreciate i know you've been with you've been with us for a long time and i really really appreciate that it speaks a lot so let's uh let's join everyone will join together in prayer for going nowhere so father we bless you. We thank you. Thank you, Father, for always looking after us. Thank you, Father, for being there for us. Thank you, Father. Many times, I know many times we have worried about things that never came to pass. So, Father, we ask that you, you would forgive us for that. Father, you would help us to always know and trust and understand that you, with you, all things will be good. Everything will be okay. Father, we ask you that you would have mercy upon this dear, this dear gentleman. We ask you, Father, that you would see to it that his vision does not get any worse. We ask you, Father, by your love, by your grace, by your mercy, to sustain his vision and even perhaps even make it better. Heal his vision. We thank you, Father. We bless you. You are the great and awesome God. You who keep your covenant of love with those who love you and those who follow your commands. We thank you, Father. We cry unto you. Send your spirit to this dear gentleman. Send your angels. Send Raphael, if you will. I think about Tobit, the story in Tobit of... of uh, Tobit going blind, and how Raphael healed him. So, Father, I ask you that you would do something with going nowhere. You would stop this, this dimness of vision, the progression of it, and you would even heal his vision. We thank you, Father. We bless you. You are great. You are holy. You are awesome. You are good. You are merciful. Thank you. For hearing us thank you for your mercy we bless you amen amen everyone said amen 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 yes and as always going nowhere let me know how things are going there let me know how things are going if you need any more prayer in the future it will be our pleasure to pray for you okay yeah with, with Seek the Lord, I agree. Yes, hang in there. Praise God. Yes, hang in there. Going nowhere. Hang in there. Yeah, so I got... Uh, I got it. Got a...
All right, all right. I think we got sound again now. My apologies. Again, there's something going on with the uh, system here. It seems to be acting up here. Uh, what was the last thing? When did it? When did the sound cut out? Was it when it was it when I was switching screens? When did the sound cut out? Did it just cut out just like that, like while I was talking, or was it when I was going from one uh, scene to another scene? Randy says talking, yeah, before that. So did it, I'm trying to, it just cut off, just cut off. It just cut off at your amen. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know. Trying to troubleshoot this. I know in the past couple of weeks we've been having trouble here, trying to troubleshoot what, what the problem is. I've tried some things, but apparently... Uh, we have yet to put our finger on exactly what the problem is here. So hopefully we'll get that taken care of. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you for letting me know that. Hopefully everything is just, hopefully everything's going to be good from here on in. Soldier of Yahweh says, before you switch screens, and out of the blue, I believe it was after your prayer, it's most likely devil messing with you. Huh? Well, we've had this for the past couple of weeks. Yeah, so, um, well, at least we got the prayer in there. That's the thing, right? At least we got the prayer in there. So, yes, going nowhere, blessings, blessings. Hope, hope everything is uh, uh, going to go well with you. Keep me informed. Keep me in the know. Anytime you ever need an, any more prayer, any you know any more prayer, uh, just let me know. We'll, it'll be a pleasure to pray for you. Okay, so um, there is a video that I posted a long well, how many? Well, it was a couple years ago, I think. Now it's been a while. Uh, it was about how Marcion is uh, considered to be the firstborn of Satan, and how evil he is how how wicked he or how wicked he was so i posted a video about that and i got some comments and i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to uh, address these comments in just a minute here soldier of yahweh says i've been experiencing an evil pre presence ever since i was tor observant Soldier of Yahweh, that reminds me of um, myself back in 1992 in July when I first really started really seriously following the ways of God. And every single night I used to have nightmares. Every night I had nightmares. And I knew I was in a spiritual war. So um, what I did was I went and I purchased a couple books on spiritual warfare. One of those books is what I have right here, this book here. And another book as well I purchased on spiritual warfare. And um, and what I did was I, um, I, I decided after reading these books, I decided to clean my, uh, my, my home up of, of all the things that uh, is not uh, particularly of God. Okay? Like... Uh, like I would have some secular music in, you know, actually I had lots of secular music. Uh, back in the day I was a teenager, so I had like music posters all over the place of all these different musicians and bands and such. Uh, and uh, I, used to, I used to have books as well of like uh, spiritual kind of books, this kind of stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't in line with Torah. So what I did was... I decided to 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 get rid of everything in one day. I went through my entire home, almost every square inch of it, and I took everything and burned it. And when I couldn't burn, I trashed it. I destroyed it and trashed it because I thought I don't want anybody else to have this. I don't want anybody else to, you know, to uh to use this. But I destroyed it, trashed it, you know, all kinds of stuff like clothes that I purchased at 
you know, concerts and such and all kinds of stuff I had. I had a whole bonfire going. So after I burned it all, after I cleaned my house, the nightmares stopped completely. Boom. It was like a night and day difference. The atmosphere, the spiritual atmosphere in my home was just absolutely uh, like brand new, fresh spiritual atmosphere. So it was wonderful. It was beautiful. Uh, Soldier of Yahweh, I'm not sure if uh, if that would apply to you. I thought I'd share that just in case that might apply to you. If you haven't already, uh, I would... Um, I would recommend you do that. I would recommend you would go through everything that you may have, be it anything, uh, even games. Um, certain games could be conducive to like witchcraft, sorcery, this kind of stuff, or you know, overly violent games, these kind of things as well. Just to go through everything and clean everything out, clean everything off. You can do whatever you got to do, and that will. Uh, improve your spiritual hygiene. Keep in mind, I, I do not believe that 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 any kind of evil can can prevail or can be even um can afflict you or oppress you in any way unless there is a reason for them to do See, evil spirits work on, uh, they work on, uh, like, the legal system per, per se. Like, if they have a legal right to be in your life, if they have a legal right to uh, oppress you, uh, this kind of thing, then they might. Soldier of Yahweh says, if I do play video games, they're mainly based on history as well as religion. A game I did play earlier today was Game Boy called The Bible Game, but I don't play anything overly violent. Now, I'm not saying, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that's what the problem is, but I'm just saying that you know that's one of the things it could be. It could be a million different things. It could be a million things. It could be something that you have, something that you own. It could be something that's secondhand. It could be something that's... Uh, it can be something that you're doing, uh, whether you're doing it knowingly or unknowingly. Either way. I would just recommend that you pray about it. You know, pray about it. Ask, ask the Father if there's anything that is in your, in your heart, in your life, in your actions, in your lifestyle, in your home. Books, um, music, movies, whatever the case is, that is not... Um, compatible with, with Torah. From my own experience, cleaning out this kind of stuff is what really helped me win the battle. Definitely. All right. Thank you, Sto uh, Soldier of Yahweh. So I posted this video a long time ago about Marcion and about how he was wicked. Uh, he was uh, uh, He was condemned as uh excuse me as a um firstborn of satan uh different church fathers said different things about him it wasn't just one church father it wasn't just polycarp i mean we got like justin martyr and other other uh church fathers as well just outright condemned marcin not just for evil doctrine even though he did have an evil doctrine but because of this his talk about spiritual uh Spiritual things like they were saying he had, you know, demons in it, demons on his the the tongue of a serpent, the you know, demons in his mouth, so to speak. He he was uh, the firstborn of Satan, very very wicked man. And so, for the purpose of, I don't want to embarrass anybody here, so I redacted this name. This person says, I do not see why he is evil. So I explained. He taught lies. Okay. And this is the this is the language of the devil, lies. He taught lies. He blasphemed. 
the Holy Spirit. He blasphemed God. How did he blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Well, because he blasphemed the God of the, the so-called God of the Old Testament. Keep in mind, up until when he came into the scene, there was no quote-unquote Old Testament versus New Testament. There was none like that. It was all just the scriptures. The whole entire first century, up until the time of Marcion, it wasn't called Old Testament. None of that nonsense. I think that this is a very misleading kind of thing for Bible publishers to, to slap Old Testament on the front of a, you know, 39 books or depending on what Bible you have, because there are so many different Bible canons. I think it's very misleading. And I think that if we were to go back into the first century, we would see that uh, the, uh, the disciples, Jesus himself, the disciples, they would be absolutely outraged that you call their scriptures, I say their scriptures because that is what they counted as scripture. They counted the Torah as scripture, the prophets as scripture, the law and the prophets, the Ketavim, as they say, the Tanakh, the TNK in that order for a reason, T on top, T on top Torah, and under that, Nevi'im, the prophets, and the K under that, the writings as in the historical writings and the poetic writings and such. So in, for the entire first century and into the second century, up until the time of Marcion, it was just called scripture. And all of the writings that, that eventually were written, that became, that, that was put into the library that we now, that we now call the New Testament, all of those writings were just simply what they were. There were, there were uh, a few book, a uh, few biographies um, written by unknown people, addressed to unknown people, versus Luke, the Gospel of Luke, written by an, an anonymous person. We call him Luke. I think it probably was Luke, written to Theophilus, one person. So there, there were a couple biographies of Jesus floating around. They were not considered to be holy scripture. They were just simply writings of guys who decided to write down what happened in the life of Jesus. Like journals, basically. Now, these people were not considered to be, uh, even to, the, to this day, most scholars would tell you that uh, they're, they're, they were not first, first-hand witnesses. They were not witnesses. None of them were witnesses. And then we got all the, the letters of Paul floating around. But these letters were simply personal letters from, from some guy by the name of Paul to either one person or groups of people, depending on which epistle you're talking about. But Paul did not write his epistles to be, quote-unquote, holy scripture. They were just letters of encouragement, letters of theology, this kind of stuff. Keep in mind, in the book of Acts, Paul was not considered to be like the author of holy scripture. No, not even close to it. Consider how they, how they treated Paul when Paul went to Jerusalem to speak, like he, the problem was in Acts chapter 15, after thousands of people already got saved, you know, thousands of people were added to the church. We read that in, in the book of Acts. So after years, you know, the Gentiles wanted a piece of the pie too, right? The Gentiles wanted in on it. And so there were people going around uh, in Judea saying that the Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to be saved. So of course, Paul and Barnabas and um, Titus, uh, they had, you know, they, they had a problem with that. So they did not have the authority to speak to it. Paul did not have the authority to speak to it. He did not have the authority to address the issue. That's why he had to escalate the matter to the brass, okay? He had to go to the top. He had to go to Jerusalem. He had to go to the headquarters of the church, so to speak, and he had to speak to Peter in ultimately James. So how did they treat Paul? They didn't say, oh, Paul, you're the apostle to the Gentiles. You should know. You should know what, what's required of the Gentiles in order to get saved. You should know how they, should, how they get saved. You should know whether or not they need to get circumcised. But they didn't say that. They didn't give Paul a word in edgewise. They left him in the back corner. And rightly so. I mean, Paul... Even he himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, I'm, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. 
I'm the least of all the, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle, he said. He's, he admitted he's not a witness of any of it. He didn't witness the birth. He didn't witness the miracles. He didn't witness this, the baptism. He didn't witness the, the, the crucifixion. He didn't witness the resurrection. He did claim, claim, that doesn't mean he did, but he did claim to witness the resurrected Christ after the fact, years down the road. Some scholars would say years, some scholars would say five, six, seven years, or even longer. But he did, he claimed to have witnessed the resurrected Christ, and that would be in a vision. Of course, according to uh, the book of Acts, he was knocked off his high horse, uh, pun intended, and, and, he, uh, and he had a vision. How do we know it was a vision and that Jesus himself didn't appear in physical form? Because nobody else saw it. And depending on what account you read, whether it's Acts chapter 9 or Acts chapter 22 or Acts chapter 26, it's all different. <laughs> one hears the voice but doesn't see anything. And the other one see the other account when they recount it, it's like, well, they saw a light but they didn't hear the voice. Okay, whatever. Uh, whatever the case is, I think it's pretty clear that Paul had a vision. So he claims that he saw the resurrected Christ. But he didn't, he didn't witness anything in regards to the physical real, down-to-earth, literal ministry of Jesus, hands-on, face-to-face. Nothing. He wasn't there for the baptism, wasn't there for any, the life of Jesus. He wasn't there for the crucifixion. He wasn't there for the resurrection. So, so Marcion comes along, self-proclaimed dis disciple of Paul, Judge for yourself whether he was a good disciple of Paul or not. Again, we have multiple church fathers that renounced him and denounced him as evil and full of demons. Again, even Polycarp, Polycarp himself said he's the firstborn of Satan. So we got this question, I do not see why he is evil. There are multiple layers to this. Number one, Marcion introduced a doctrine that was new, not true. Marcin introduced an anti-law, anti anti-Jewish doctrine that was new. And seeing that it was new, it was not true because he had nothing to support him himself. Excuse me, he had nothing to support himself apart from perhaps his interpretation of Paul's epistles. But Paul, in and of himself, doesn't have the authority. You know, Soldier of Yahweh, you're talking in a comment there earlier about why I didn't mention uh, Romans. The reason why I didn't mention Romans is I, I gave you the reason last night. Because if Paul says anything that's not in the Tanakh, as a Berean, if Paul says anything contrary to what we have in the Tanakh as a Brian, you must throw it out. If Paul says it's yea and the Tanakh says it's nay, guess what? You can choose. You can choose either Paul or choose the Tanakh. I recommend you choose the Tanakh. Be like the Bereans of Acts chapter 17. A little bit of context for those of you who might be new here. You say, what are you talking about, Christopher? Bereans? So, Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to a city by the name of Berea. And he preaches, quote-unquote, his gospel. And the men of Berea, it says, were noble men. They were honorable men. Doesn't say they were bad. Doesn't say that they, you know, did anything bad. They were noble. They were honorable. So they were praised. They were praised in, the, in Acts chapter 17. So what did they do? What did they do in, in their nobility? What did they do in all of their goodness and honorable conduct? What did they do? Well, they heard Paul out, of course. I think, again, we need to be humble. We need to be humble, come to the table, say, this is what I believe. This is why I believe it. I might be wrong. So... Show me your evidence if you have anything contrary to what I say, and we'll 
we'll, we'll hash through it. And if you're right, and if I'm wrong, I'll say I'm wrong. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. No biggie. Everybody, make, everybody makes mistakes. And like I said, I've always said, I never have claimed exclusive truth. Never. Okay? Never claimed exclusive truth. In other words, I don't, ha I don't know it all. <laughs> Nobody knows it all. Including Paul. <laughs> he didn't know it all either. Nobody knows it all. So, the men of Berea, what did they do in all of their nobility? What did they do in all of their honorable conduct? They heard Paul out. They humbly heard his message. But they did not believe it until they first searched the scriptures to see whether or not what he said was in line with the scriptures. What were considered to be scriptures in those days? What was considered to be scriptures in those days? Certainly not the New Testament. The New Testament didn't exist. Certainly not the New Testament. The scriptures they're talking about, of course, culturally speaking, the cultural context of it and the historical context of it clearly shows you that the scriptures they spoke of were the law and the prophets and the Ketuvim, the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, the, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. Those were, those were the scriptures. So Paul, he had to align himself with the scriptures if he wanted to teach the truth. That's the reason why he kept on quoting the Torah and the, and the Nevi'im and Ketuvim throughout his epistles because he knew he had, to stake, he had to stake his doctrine on that because he has no authority in and of himself to say anything. He needs something to support his, his claims. Now, did he make accurate claims? That's up, for, that's up for debate. You know, if Paul says anything against the Torah, he's wrong. How do, say, how do you know that? How can you say that? Because it has been established for thousands of years that the Torah is from God right from the very beginning. Uh, I mean, you can go all the way back to Adam and Eve, but you can go back to Adam and Eve, you can go back to Noah, but especially in the days of Moses, Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20, the, 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 the commandments of our wonderful father was given to Moses in the sight of all the people, in the hearing of all the people. Everyone witnessed it. The whole entire nation were witnesses. So that was the foundation right there. That's the foundation. This is the reason why the Sadducees and the Samaritans only have the, the Torah. They don't, ha they don't consider the, uh, um, the prophets to be, to be legit. Because it's like, well, you, uh, you know, like Isaiah, God didn't speak to you with any witnesses. Like, you know, so how can we trust you? God spoke to Moses with the whole entire nation as a witness. Witnesses galore. They say anywhere from tens of thousands to tens of millions of people that were there. So when Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these other prophets started coming around, coming out of the woodwork, they had to prove themselves. Again, you look at the history of the scriptures. They had to prove they were not considered to be quote unquote scripture for a long time. Even even Isaiah. You look at something like the book of Psalms. They, the book of Psalms, according to Oxford University Press, was not even considered to be legit, full-on canon until like two or three hundred years after Jesus. It took a long time for these things to be tested and proven, you know, through put in the slow cooker, so to speak, and test them in, from every which way, every which angle. So finally, after... After a considerable amount of time, finally we have you know some like the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets. They were they were certified as true prophets. How can they be certified as true prophets? Because they taught Torah. They did not teach anything that went against Torah, and and they know that 
they knew that the Torah was legit because millions of witnesses. <laughs> no, when Moses came down from the mountain, he did not have to. He did not have to uh, to prove himself. He did not have to to say, "Oh, trust me, I'm a prophet. Trust me, trust me." He did not have to say that. Why? Because they all saw it. They all knew. They all heard. They all saw. It was right there. Nobody disbelieved. Nobody in their right mind would say, oh, Moses, you're not a true prophet of God. Nobody in their right mind would say that. So in, in the Tanakh, we have God who is a God of great love and mercy and compassion. We read more about his love and mercy and compassion in the so-called Old Testament than we do in the New Testament. All over and over again, you, his, he is good and his mercy endures forever. For he, endure, he is good and his love endures forever. And there's examples of this throughout the Tanakh. How God saved and elevated jo Joseph. How God so loved his people, he set them free from bondage. How God, the great, wonderful father, being the great, wonderful, and loving father he is, he gave his dear children instructions to live by. And he says right there, we talk about this often, where he said, these commandments, this Torah, is for you to be blessed. The, the purpose of this Torah is so that it will go well with you and with your children after you. We talk about this all the time. It says, it says that over and over and over and over and over again. Don't believe the Christian, the, all these narratives that go around and say, well, the Torah is just a curse or a burden. Blasphemy. Even Paul himself said the law is holy, just, and good. Why do you want to get away? Why do you want to destroy something that's holy, just, and good? The Psalms speak of, oh, not, not just the Psalms, but all through the Tanakh speaks about how the Torah is the most beautiful thing. It is the law of love. It's the law of liberty. Oh, how I love your law, says, says David. It is my meditation day and night. Streams of rivers of water flow from my eyes and tears because of those who do not obey your law. Because the law is so good. The law is so gracious. The law is so wonderful. See, the Jews understand that today. How do they understand that? Why would they understand that? Because... They studied the Torah. They know the Torah a lot more than Christians do today. As Christians today, they spend more time in Paul's epistles than in the, than in the, the bedrock of the Scripture, the Torah. Shame. Talk about building a house on sand. So Marcion comes around. And he blasphemes the Holy Spirit. It's the worst thing you could ever do. If you list a million sins, this one is the worst. How can he blaspheme the Holy Spirit? How did he? Well, he said that, this, that God, the God, the God that we read of in the, in the Tanakh, is an evil God. That is blasphemy against the Spirit of God. That is the most evil you could ever be. You can think of some of the worst things you could ever commit, of the worst crimes you could ever commit. God said you could be forgiven. Jesus said you can be forgiven of those things. But not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. God is a spirit. The Elohim that we read of throughout the scriptures, I mean the law of the prophets, is the spirit of God, which is 
the Holy Spirit of God. As he is holy, the holiest. Marcion blasphemed the Spirit. Marcion cut out the eternal Word of God. God Himself. God Himself said, scores of times, scores of times, that His law, the ordinances, the precepts, the instructions, the 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 uh, the, um, the ordinances, the precepts, the instructions, you know, the, the law, the commandments of the Torah is forever. I counted it personally myself. Just within the first five books of Moses, it was over 40 times. 40. 4 zero, Over 40 times. God said, this is eternal. This is forever. To all generations, everlasting, perpetual, permanent. He, used, he said it many different ways. There's no way anybody in their right mind will miss it. It's eternal. It's forever. Marcin comes around and says, well, the God of the New Testament is a different God. Well, what, so you, con you, you fabricate your own little New Testament, which he did, and you, and you say that you have a different God? So this is, this is so wicked. This is so incredibly wicked. Somebody might say, well, if you read Paul's epistles, it sounds like God is a different kind of guy as opposed to if you read, you know, the book of Genesis or something like that. So we have two different people saying with two different viewpoints of the same God. Y'all know there are people out there. Uh, there's a person that I know of personally. I'm not going to name him. Again, I'm not here to diss anybody. I want to respect as, as much as I possibly can here, everyone. I'll call him John. So, John was certainly not good to me. I would not say that John is a good guy. I would say he's a hypocrite. He's, a, he's an evil, wicked, weak man. Now, I spoke to somebody about the same, the same guy, by name, by name. And he's like, well, John's a great guy. John's a great guy. He's awesome. He's wonderful. I didn't, I didn't argue with him because I don't want to, I'm not here to slander anybody or to gossip about anybody. So you got two different people that would have two opposing viewpoints of the same man. Y'all know this happens all the time, right? You have people that love you. Have, you have people that hate you. You have people that think that you're great. You have people that think you're the worst thing ever. You have people that think you're the nice guy. You have people that think that you're the bad guy. True story. I'll tell you a true story. True story. There was a time in my life when I... There were two people in my life. Okay, and this was at the same time, it, relatively speaking, like within the same, like the same, within the same amount of months, just same time. Two people in my life. One person, I was not nice to. I was not nice to this one one person. I'll call this person person A. Again, I'm I don't, I'm not going to drop any names here. Person A, I was not nice to person A. In fact, I thought, he, I, I thought I was pretty harsh with person A. Person B, I tried to be nice. To, I was nice to person B. I was nice to person B, but I was not nice to person A. Guess what happened? Person A that I was not nice to said to me, and this person was very, person A was very, um, on, like really, wasn't sarcastic. I mean, really, really serious and sincere to me saying that I'm like the most polite man 
that this person has ever met and that I'm so incredibly kind and polite. But the one that I was really nice to, that person said I'm the most rude, evil person. So are they talking about the same man? Are they talking about the same man? Yes, they are. But there's two different points of view, contrary to each other. In the same way, you can have someone say, you know, this God is, is good, and you can have someone say this God is not so good. It's talking about the same God. It's talking about the same God. So just because you have an author, you got two different authors in the Bible. One author could portray the... Uh, the true God to be a God that is, you don't want to mess with this, with this God. The, another person can port, portray the same God as, as a God that's so like, just like a big teddy bear. You just go and hug and kiss this God. Are they talking about the same God? Of course, just two different points of view, two different approaches, two different opinions. So I do not see why Marcion is evil because he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He taught lies that were very destructive against the Word of God because the Word of God says it's forever, eternal, applicable to whosoever will. And so Marcion's like, oh no, that's it. Well, and they say that it was Marcion that actually is the first one to actually say to, to, to divide it between Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah, the son of Satan, the firstborn of Satan. So he's evil because he blasphemed the Holy Spirit, the most wicked thing you could ever do. He's evil because he taught lies. And number three, he's evil because he deceived people away from Torah away from the law of God. And anything that would deceive you away from obeying God is evil. Look what even Satan did himself in the garden, in the garden of Eden. Deceived Eve from obeying the commandments of God. This is what Marcion did. This is what Marcion did. This is why he is, he was considered to be the most evil. The firstborn of Satan. What can I say? The firstborn of Satan. So this is so. This is what this person said. And then, so I had to I had to redact some of this stuff. Uh, first of all, I redacted this person's screen name as well as redacted some other stuff that this person did because unfortunately, unfortunately, this person used some profane blasphemy here. Look at the difference between the so-called God. Yahweh, which he is the God, by the way, and the New Testament God, by the way, are completely different, or they're not. They're the same God. Yahweh is, and again, I'm not going to put that in there because that's something that is very, very wicked in and of itself. Also, crazy that, crazy that you say Marcion. Now, this person is not responding. This is not responding to me. This is responding to somebody else. Crazy that you say Marcion is separating Jews from Gentiles. So I, I didn't say that, uh, although he did. Um, when he when literally the Jews separated themselves by rejecting the New Testament. Rejecting the New Testament? What are you talking Nonsense. This is nonsense talk. Not only is this profane and blasphemy, but it's also nonsense talk. Reject, with Jews reject the New Testament? What are you talking The New Testament is a library of books. And there are different canons of the New Testament. We have everything from Marcion's canon, which was a different canon. He, he had different books in, the, in his New Testament than we do today. So maybe you reject the New Testament of Marcion, right? That's not to mention the New Testament of the earliest Bible that we have, or I should say the oldest Bible that we have on earth today. The oldest Bible known to man is the Codex Sinaiticus. That has different books in the New Testament too. The, the, the whole thing... Do not be bamboozled by these labels of men. Old Testament, New Testament. The Bible canon is not biblical. 
Whether you call it a New Testament, Old Testament, Red Testament, Blue Testament, Dr. Seuss, whatever, it's all just a compilation, a framework of man. Where did God ever say, I don't care whether it's in Old Testament or New Testament, where did God ever, where did Jesus ever say, here, uh, write down, here, you're supposed to put all these books together, put it all together in one book and call it the Old Testament or call it the New Testament or call it the Holy Bible. New to, you got the, the New Testament canon and the New Testament of Marcion is different than the New, New Testament of the Codex Sinaiticus, and that's different than the, than the New Testament of the Codex Vaticanus. And on and on it goes. We got all kinds of different Bibles, even up to this very day. We got a whole entire church denomination that has books in their New Testament that, that most churches don't have. The New Testament is just a library of a collection of books that man, any given man, whoever it be, be it Marcion or the people who decided to put what books they wanted to in, in the Codex Sin, uh, Sinaiticus or the Codex Vaticanus or any of these other Bible uh, canons. It's all just, it's all just a framework of men. If you were to go back in the, to the first century, you're not going to find a New Testament. You're not going to find an Old Testament either. It's called the Scriptures, or you could say the Tanakh. And they're not all put together in one book called the Holy Bible. There are different scrolls. This is why we read in Luke chapter 4 that when Jesus went to the synagogue, as his custom was, by the way, WWJD, what would Jesus do? He went to the synagogue. It says they handed him what? The New Testament, the Old Testament, the Holy Bible, no, no, and no. They handed him the scroll of Isaiah. Why is that? Because they, there was no Bible back in those days. They had the scriptures kept on each one of these books were a different scroll, very similar to the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were, they were all different scrolls kept in different places for different reasons. So when you say reject the New Testament, first of all, I would ask you what New Testament you're talking about. First of all there, buddy, what New Testament are you talking about? Because each one is a different library made up by different men. Not, we have no, we have no evidence at all that any of them were commanded by God to be compiled. To say reject the New Testament to me is just as ludicrous as, as to say reject the library. What, what, what do you mean reject the library? Yeah, of course there are books in the library that are better than other books. There is a lot of truth there. There's a lot of lies there. Hey, the library is just the library. I don't know a Jew anywhere that rejects everything the New Testament says. Even one of the most anti-missionary Jews on, the, on earth today, a man who has basically dedicated his, his life to combat evangelical Christianity, he says Jesus was a Torah-observant Jew and, and his disciples were good. You know, he said it's, it's, very, it's likely that Jesus was a Torah. It could be that Jesus was a Torah-observant Jew and his disciples were very you know, wonderful Torah, uh, Torah following Jews. Then he goes into the saying about, but Paul. Yeah. So uh, to say reject the New Testament is just an, a, a super overly simplistic over generalization. It's just as, it's just as, to me, it's just as stupid as saying reject the, the library. You don't re be a little bit more specific. Because there are arguably hundreds, if not thousands, of different concepts or claims in the New Testament. I don't know of any Jew that it rejects them all. And the New Testament is not supposed to be a whole. James did not write his book to be in the New Testament. Even Paul. There's no evidence at all that we have from Paul that he wrote any of his epistles to be in the New Testament. I don't think he even thought of it. It was like not even on his mind. 
Obviously, it wasn't on Luke's mind when he wrote the Gospel of Luke because he didn't write it to the world. He didn't write it to anybody other than one man, Theophilus. Do understand, every single book of the New Testament, where the, the authors did not expect or even want, it's not like they wanted it to be in a New Testament. Same with the, you know, same with the so-called Old Testament. Isaiah did not write his book to be in the so-called Old Testament. He wrote his, his book to be a book of Scripture, of the Word of God, of, of God's Word. Same with Psalms. I do not know. Even the most anti-Christian Jews I am aware of. Do not reject everything in the New Testament. There are some things, yeah, some things, of course. Because again, the New Testament authors, which one of the New Testament authors even claim to be inspired? Like, seriously. You read the, the uh, books of Moses, you read, again, something like Isaiah, Ezekiel, you, you get it right up front. You get, thus says the Lord. Thus says the God of Israel. This is what the God of Israel says. This is what God says. And God spoke. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. You don't get any of that kind of stuff like that. It's not like, it's not that authority in the New Testament. Why? Because these, none of the New Testament authors claim to be prophets. None of them. Actually, some of them didn't even claim, didn't even tell us who they were. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for example, didn't even say their name. We don't even know who they were. So anyway, I answered this person. Um, explaining why Marcion was, was evil, at least to some degree. And so this person says, okay, I do not claim to know the truth like you. Uh, how do I claim to know the truth, buddy? Is this another lie that you've baked into uh, your comment? How do I know? How do I claim to know the truth? I'm sure everybody that knows me from the in the live chat, those of you who know me, I'm I'm not one to go. Hey, I know we know we are we're like we're the arbiters of truth here. We are we own exclusive truth. No, there are some things I do believe is true, and I'll give you evidence for that if you ask. But I'm open to change my mind if you have stronger evidence than I do. And this is what I think we, we should all do. I believe we should all have this attitude to say, hey, uh, this is what I believe to be true. And this is why. What do you believe and, and why? And let's, let's talk about it. And if you got stronger, if you, if you think that I believe something that's not true, I want to know. And if you've got good evidence behind it, then I'll accept that and I will change my, I'm, I'm willing to change. I'm not, I'm not the type of person that would say, oh, I know the truth and nobody can, can ever, you know, change my mind. No, no I'm, it's not like that. You know, generally speaking, it's, this is what I think. And, and you know what? A lot of stuff, and I'm sure there's a lot of witnesses in the live chat as well. You can, you can attest to this. A lot of stuff, I don't know. A lot of questions you, you, you ask and some, it looks like, I don't know the answer. I, I'm asking a lot. I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions myself. I'm asking. I think I probably asked more questions than anybody else because I, I'm just asking questions. I'd like to know. So no, uh, I, I, I'd like you there, buddy, to show me what you mean by claim to know the truth. Why is, why is it, he says, why is it evil, yo, 
you'll rebuke the Old Testament, but not evil to revoked the New Testament. Can you actually answer? So I did answer and I said, what you said is not true. I rebuke the Old Testament. What, 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 in the world, what in the world does that mean? And, and to revoke, and to, but not evil to revoke the New Testament? Did I say it's not evil to revoke the New Testament? This is why I answered, I said, it's not true. So I said, it's not true. I said, do yourself a favor. Learn a little, learn a little before speaking. Learn, you want to know about me? You want to accuse me of something? Learn a little bit about me before you accuse me of something. And so in reply to that, uh, this person says, well, uh, that what I thought, avoid the question. Uh, I didn't avoid the question. I addressed the question. That's a lie. I didn't avoid the question. I addressed the question. What you said is a lie. I don't, I, you think I say things I don't even say. And then it's like, can you answer the question? Why is Marcion evil for rejecting Yahweh when the Jews reject the person you believe to be the son of God? Why is it Marcion why is Marcion evil for rejecting Yahweh? Yahweh is <laughs> Yahweh is God. It's very clear. Yahweh is is God. And so if you reject Yahweh and you you claim that you accept Jesus but re reject the God of Jesus, the Father of Jesus. It's an oxymoron. And it's not just evil. And again, this is this is a straw man because this is this was not my argument. My argument was not that Marcion was Marcion was evil for rejecting Yahweh. That's again, that's another lie. You got to watch these people because these people put so many lies in the, in the comments. It's just crazy. Absolutely, they answer they answer me with a question that has like lie 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 all over. It's just lies. But what can you expect from somebody? who believes a lie. <laughs> uh, why is Marcin evil for rejecting Yahweh? Who said that? I said that Marcin's evil because he blasphemed the Spirit of God. I said he's evil because he cut out what God said. He taught lies. That's, that was my thing. He taught lies. He rejected what God said was, was forever to be observed. And also that Marcin lead, led people away from the holy, just, and good law of God. The law of love, the law of holiness, the law of goodness. Anybody who rejects the law of love, the law of holiness, and the law of goodness is evil. And anybody who would influence other people to do so is also evil. So that's, the, that's your answer. Stop with the straw man. So... When the Jews reject the person you believe to be the Son of God. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to wrap my mind around how you could put so much confusion into one question. Why is Marcin evil for rejecting Yahweh? Again, uh, I, that's not my claim, although if you do reject Yahweh, it's definitely evil anyway, okay? But that wasn't my claim that, that you were responding to. Uh, when the Jews reject the person you believe to be the Son of God. Well, the reason why the Jews reject the person that uh, reject Jesus is because of the way Marcion, well, you can, you can bring it back down to Paul, but at least the way Marcion presented it and the way that the quasi-Marcion, antinomian, antinomian church presents Jesus today. That's the reason why the Jews object, reject them. So it's not the Jews that I, that I blame. It's the people that teach the lies because the Jews know more than the, a lot of these other people about what they are to expect from their Messiah. 
They know more. Here's my question for you there, Mr. Black. I'm just saying black as, uh, because I blacked your name out. Um, here's my question for you. How is it that before Paul came on the scene in the book of Acts, it's like everybody, almost everybody that got saved, the thousands and thousands that were pouring into the kingdom were all Jews. Can you, can you explain that to me? How is it that the Jews didn't start dropping out of the scene until Paul, especially Marcion, and, his, and Marcion, the, again, because of the evil, the evil doctrine of Marcion, the lies that he taught about who Jesus was, of course the Jews are going to go, oh, if that's who Jesus was, forget it, I don't want it. No wonder. The reason being is because of the lies of Marcion. So it's not the Jews that I would say are evil for rejecting it. They reject it. They reject the lies that were that was taught by Marcion. And it's actually that's not evil at all. Finally, one more question here from this person. Okay, here's the issue. You didn't understand what I was asking. Well, uh if you are a little bit clearer, then maybe that would help. Here, I'll try to clarify myself as best I can. I'm asking if you claim Marcion is evil, I do, then it is not also, then is it not also just as evil for the Jews to discard the, the New Testament? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Can you, can you please show me one Jew that you know of that discards everything, every concept that the New Testament, that's in your New Testament. First of all, what New Testament are you talking about? Talking about Marcion's New Testament? Since it seems like you're a lover of this wicked Marcion. Is it Marcion's New Testament you're talking about? Is it Luther's New Testament you're talking about? Is it the Codex Sinaiticus? Is it the Codex Vaticanus? Or somewhere else in between? Is it the Tawahedo New Testament? Which New Testament are you talking about first? And then, and then, produce, give me the name of one Jew that rejects every concept of that, of whatever New Testament you're talking about. Because again, this is, this is overly simplistic, super shallow stuff, super, super shallow ways of thinking. Again, it's like saying, discard the library. The Jews that I know of that are the most anti-Christian Jews, they are very well versed in the New Testament. They read the New Testament. They quote the New Testament. They believe the New Testament to a certain degree. I think it's, it's safe to say that. They believe that Yeshua actually existed. They believe that, that, that he had disciples. They believe in his crucifixion. They believe in the doctrines of the New that you can find in, in most New Testaments today. Excuse me, the doctrines of, uh, that are conducive with the Torah, by the way. Like, for example, when Paul said, uh, it's not the doers, it's not the hearers of the law that are justified, but the doers of the law that are justified. What Jew will reject that? Paul himself, in the midst of his dumpster fire called Galatians, he said himself in, in, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, he said, fornication, variations, emulations, revelations, adultery, idolatry, heresies, envyings, uncleanness, lasciviousness, drunkenness, murderings, sedition, sorcery, prostitution, and lying. Anybody who does any of these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, that's Torah. By the way, that's Torah. Most Jews, I would expect to, would just love that. They, just, they would just eat that right up because that's Torah. The book of James, beautiful, beautiful. Teaching Torah all the way, teaching obedience all the way. What Jew is going to reject that? In fact, the, the book of James was written to the 12 tribes. Are there some things in the New Testament that are 
interpreted in a way that a lot of Jews reject? Yes, there are some things that are interpreted in a way. Now, that doesn't mean that that the author necessarily of, of any given book is wrong. It could be our interpretation that's wrong. Again, let's get out of this super simplistic way of thinking. Stop being so shallow in your thoughts. At the end of the day, well, to answer your question here clearly, I, I, it's really hard to answer your question clearly without knowing what, exactly what you mean. But you have to answer, you have, what New Testament, what do you mean by reject? Like reject everything in it? I don't know any Jew that rejects everything in it. So that, if that's the truth, if, what, if that's what you're asking me, then another lie in your question. Another lie. Another lie. However, my question to you is, how is it that in the first few years of the New Testament church in the book of Acts, thousands of Jews came in? It's like when Gentiles first started coming into the kingdom, when they were interested, it's like, well, what are we going to do with these Gentiles? C can they get saved? How do they get saved? Do they have to get circumcised? Acts chapter 15. Do they have to obey all the Torah, some of the Torah, none of the Torah? What do they have to do? What's up with this? And of course, James being the head of the church, not Peter, James, as we know of in history, church history, Hegesippus, and many other, in other doctrines as well, other documents that uh, James, and we see this in action in, in Acts chapter 15 and in Acts chapter 21, James was the head. He was the one who brought down the final word. So what did he say about the Gentiles in Acts chapter 15? They have to obey these four laws, right? to abstain from sexual immorality, to abstain from eating of blood, from strangled animals, and from idolatry. Guess what? Those are the same four laws that are required for the Gentiles to convert to Judaism in the first century. So what James basically said, what he said in, in his actions, what he actually did was he confirmed that the Gentiles have to convert to Judaism in order to get saved. Yeah, the quote-unquote God of the Tanakh, the God of the Torah. Yes, 100%. Anybody who says otherwise, again, show me your evidence to prove me wrong. If you don't, I rest my case. Okay, see what we have here in the live chat before we get too far. John says, when it says in Ezekiel that the soul who sins shall die, do you think that's referring to physical death or spiritual death? Sp uh, spiritual death, John. I, again, John, this is something that I have, I have answered um, numerous times uh, in the past little while. Yes, spiritual death. Thank you, John. Sean says, amen. I'm Paul Christopher. Preach it, brother. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. Randy says, I've read that Marcion actually changed some words of Paul's letters. Is there any proof that you know of? Uh, yeah. Um, he also changed the Gospel of Luke, too. What he did was he changed it to, uh, to exclude the Judaic the Jewishness of the faith. And this is something that's typical too of, um, of any of these kind of uh, scribes, transmission of, of the text. Uh, you know, so Marcion's changes would be just a, a few of the 250,000 changes that we, that we know of. Uh, however, because, you know, because we know of, of, of some of these changes, we, uh, we know that um, we know what the original was, or at least I can't say we know what the original was because of all the different variations, but the very fact that you can point out that Marcion changed some stuff uh, goes to show us that we know uh, that there's evidence of what it was originally, at least to, to some degree of certainty. Yes, Randy. A, a good um, 
This reminds me of when we spoke to Dr. Price a couple years ago. We had Dr. Robert M. Price with us on here as a live guest, and he spoke of Marcion uh, and of Paul's writings uh, to a, 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 a great extent, actually. Uh, so he has a lot to say about that as well, and he actually studied it more than I have. He's got a book called out the, Colos- the Colossal Apostle Paul, in which he documents and, and talks about some of these things, Randy. That, be, that might be something you might want to have a look at anyway. The Colossal Apostle Paul. Yeah, thanks, Randy. That's an excellent question. Exposed says, so many inconsistencies in his conversation in a court of law, his testimony would be worthless. This is right. Yeah, uh, even then he didn't quote the Torah correctly. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Ali, good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Ali says, God gave us the law as a mercy to us. I agree 100%. 100%. Any... I, I look at God as, I, I look at God, I look at the Creator as like, uh, as our Father. So as any father, as any good father would, would give his, his children instructions to live, to, to go by, I think that this is what God did for us. God gave us instructions, laws, regular rules, uh, boundaries, guidelines to go by so that it will go well with us. You know, it's not for a burden. It's not to prove that we're a sinner. I don't think that anybody needs the Torah to prove that they're a sinner. You go ask anybody who has no clue what the Torah is, you say, hey, do you you mess up? (laughs) Everybody would say, yeah, well, no one's perfect, right? So you... But the Christians say, well, the Torah was given to prove that you're a sinner so that you know, you know, whatever. No, the Torah was given as a mercy to us. The law of God was given as a mercy to us. If God didn't, if God was such a horrible God, which of course he's not, but if he was and he didn't care, then he wouldn't give any law. Eh, just go do whatever you, go on into destruction. Who cares? No. The law is 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 holy. It's just. It's good. It's 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 a law of love. It's a law of of justice and righteousness. Ali says the law equals the way you're supposed to live your life. How can you believe in a God that created you, yet He didn't give you instructions on how you're supposed to live? True, hundred percent. That's awesome. Flo says, hello, everyone. Just got home from work. Hello, Flo. Welcome. Blessings, blessings. Hope you, have a, hope you had a wonderful day at work. Ali says, my own opinion, everything true in the New Testament is not new, and everything not new is true. Yeah, generally speaking, theologically speaking, sure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Child of one true king says, hey, Flo. Flo says, Marcin claimed that uh, the God of the Old Testament is not the same God as the New Testament, which is ridiculous. You are correct. He lied. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Flo. Yes, he lied. Sean, dumpster fire called Galatians. Yes. Randy says, thank you for the information. Well, thank you for asking, Randy. Appreciate that. Z divine. Z divine. This is very true. Very true. Okay. All right. Uh, Soldier of Yahweh. I think what I'm what I'm gonna do here is pull up your comment from earlier. Soldier of Yahweh. So, for those who don't know, it, uh, Soldier of Yahweh handle is Torah is Key to Life, which is an awesome handle. I love this. Torah is Key to Life. Says, Shalom, Chris. I would just like to conclude and move on from the topic of original sin. 
my summary of what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is the Bible doesn't say straightforward, uh, you've sinned because Adam and Eve sinned, which, yeah, it doesn't say that straightforward. It doesn't even imply that. Uh, no, I'm saying because of Adam and Eve's sin from eating of a tree God said not to eat from. It says, no, I'm saying because... Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, I believe this is all figurative, by the way. I don't think that this is literal. You want, to know, you want to know why? Uh, I got lots of content on that as well. However, yes, um, there's this tree. Uh, God said, don't eat from this tree. And Adam did, Eve did. So they sinned. And so they die because of their sin. The soul that sins shall die. Not another one. Not another soul. Not Abel's soul. Not Seth's soul. Not Cain. No. But they did because God is a just God. He punishes those who do the crime, not those who do not do the crime. That's that's no that's not a very just judge that would ever do that. Okay, so it says, No, I'm saying because of lead them and their descendants to be cursed. Led them led them and their descendants to be cursed. Uh, where do you get that from? It says, He shall bruise your head and he she shall bruise she shall bruise your head and he shall bruise his heel and so on so that's a prophecy of the messiah it has nothing to do that's a prophecy okay so how did the serpent if you will the devil bruise or strike at the heel of the messiah we read about it in the book of psalms okay and we read about it in the in the story of the flogging and such. Now again, this is this is a figure of speech to strike at the heel. And this is what uh, this is what Satan, this is what the devil did to Yeshua. He struck it. He struck at him, figuratively speaking, he struck at his heel. Of course, he didn't. It wasn't a mortal blow per se, in the sense of actually keeping him down. He shall he shall bruise. I think I think you mean he and not she. He shall bruise your head. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Yeah, he bruised the head of the serpent. Yes. So that has nothing to do with original sin. Zero. Zip. Nothing. If you want to read that into that, okay, if you want to read that in there, you do whichever, whatever you want to do, but I'm just, it, it's nothing to say. N nothing about it. This is nothing about original sin here at all. It does not say, all of your descendants are cursed because of what you did. It doesn't say that. He he, one person, shall bruise your head and you shall strike at his heel. It's got nothing to do with original sin at all. Nothing. This was a curse to Adam and Eve of disobedience. No, that wasn't a curse. Uh, this is a prophecy of the Messiah. That was not a curse. She shall bruise your head. I think you mean he shall bruise your head. He shall bruise his heel. That's a prophecy, not a curse. Uh, you didn't read or look into the book of Romans, and I explained why I didn't. Actually, I explained it last night why I didn't. I said if Paul says anything new that's not in the Tanakh, and it goes against what the Tanakh says, what the, what the law and the prophets say, then throw it out anyway. What, why should I read from... Paul that would say that might mean something that is contrary to the law and the prophets. I want to look at this from a first century point of view. I want to look at this from the point of view of the Bereans. So if Paul talks about original sin and the law and the prophets speak against it, which I do believe it's pretty clear that it speaks against it, very clear, then Paul's wrong. Okay, so if that's what he meant in Romans, he's wrong. Now, he may not have meant it to be how St. Augustine of the Roman Catholic Church taught it, which it seems like you've heard that, that whole original sin doctrine, and unfortunately, it looks like you bought into it. So, you didn't read, into, you didn't read or look into the book of Romans, okay? Uh, when, I stated, when I stated it also, you just talked about Psalms and David's mother. Yes, and that's for a reason. We go by... Yeah, and if you want me to pull up the book of Romans, I'll do that. 
However, I will do that with a Berean eye. I guess the bottom line is this. It doesn't matter what Paul says. If, if it matters what the law and the prophets say, Paul cannot bring anything new. He can't change it. And if he said that the original sin is, is true in any way, if, he, if that's what he taught, if he, if he taught the Augustinian doctrine of it, then he's wrong. Even, even St. Augustine's contemporary, St. John Chrysostom, said it as well. You know, that it's ludicrous. It's ridiculous to think that this doctrine of original sin that somebody would actually pay for, bear the sin of somebody else, basically. It says, from my comprehension, Cain kills Abel because he knows knowledge of good and evil, and he, Cain, became evil. Uh, n- n- no, that's not the reason why Cain killed Abel. Cain killed Abel because of jealousy. We re- have you read the Sefer Hayashar, the book of Jasher, or the uh, book of Jubilees? It goes into great detail of that, which I think it's, it's pretty clear. And we also get hints of this throughout the scriptures as well into uh, the New Testament as well. Cain being the elder brother, as elder brothers, unfortunately, sometimes are like that. They're jealous of the younger brother, as in the parable of the uh, prodigal son, for example, David and Elias, um, his older brother as well. Uh, we got uh, Esau and Jacob. We got, uh, you know, we got all kinds of different um, examples you can go by. So if he knew that if he had the knowledge of good and evil, then it's not because it doesn't, it doesn't say he ate from the tree. Okay. If he had the knowledge of good and evil, then it's because he obtained it. I mean, we can talk about it all the time about our speculations, but what do the scriptures actually say? It doesn't say what you said here. Be careful. Don't read into the text what's not there. Don't try your best. This is why we talk about critical thinking so much. Try your best not to assume things. Read it as it as it reads. And if it's if it's unclear, which um, the Genesis chapters one through uh, one through four at least, if not one through five, is is unclear in in many things. So you said the reason we sin today is because of our origin. Uh, if that's true, then we have, we're, we're hopeless. So we sin because of our origin. No, we don't. That's not true at all. We sin because we choose to do something that's against the law of God. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. It doesn't say sin is inherited. God forbid. Sin is transgression of the law. So apparently, soldier of Yahweh, what you have done here, you have put a blinder on, exactly what I told you not to do, with all of the scripture and all of the reasons and all of the logic that I, was, that I use in the past couple live streams. You just put a blinder on as if they didn't exist. It's convenient to do, to do that if you, want to, if you want to hold on to original sin, if that's the reason, if you want to, I, you know, you do whatever you want to do. And it makes it convenient to ignore all the stuff that I said. I don't think it's a good thing to do. Uh, I, I wouldn't re- recommend you do that. If you believe that I'm wrong, then address every one of the points of logic and reason and scriptures that I quoted for the past couple, not, couple days. Address them all. You, hey, I'm open. If you can convince me, if you can present something that's a really good argument, I'll change my mind. All right? But please don't ignore all of the stuff that I brought forward. And the reason we sin today is because of our origin, Adam and Eve eating from the tree. That's not the reason. That's not what it says. When you repent, when you repent, you repent of your sin. All of this sin, it's, okay, so what, this doctrine completely demolishes the basis of the Torah 
end of the call to repentance. It's a horrible doctrine. Paul says this clearly in that verse. Well, if you think he, that's what he meant, okay, but prove it, you know, uh, prove that this is right by giving me a good, logical, reasonable explanation of how this can work with any sense of justice or in the light of Deuteronomy 24, Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 33, or all the prophets for that matter. I mean, you can look at all the prophets. All the prophets call people away from sin. Sin not. You know, purge yourself from the sin. If this is something that's inherited, what's the use of saying that? Because I, I, do, not, I do not preaching the gospel today that would have... I do not, preaching the gospel today would not have been as much of a hassle if we did not know good and evil. <sighs> You're putting a lot of weight on a very abstract concept in Genesis, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I've done videos, uh, live streams about this before. What does it mean, the knowledge of good and evil? Again, you can assume that you mean, oh, it just means to know what, the difference between good and evil. But does, is that really what it means? For example, when Adam knew his wife Eve, does it mean just head knowledge? Or does it mean intimate? To intimately be involved with? Again, soldier of Yahweh. Um, try to remove yourself from the preconceived ideas and the assumptions. To have the knowledge of good and evil. Is it, is it too much to say that the knowledge of good and evil would be like the knowledge, how it says throughout the Tanakh, talks about how this man knew that woman. What does it mean by that? I don't think it means just knowing her, like in the head, <laughs> but I, I'm thinking it means a lot more than that. It means there's an intimate involvement here. So could it be that the knowledge of good and evil is to be, is kind of like this twilight zone of, of, of eating from the cup of, of God and from the cup of demons too, of, of really getting intimately doing the holy things, but also doing evil things too by actively engaging in evil. The ancient philosophers, I think, were really good in the sense that they would say the epitome of all wisdom and the epitome of all knowledge is to know that you know nothing. I found that to be true. My mother used to say this a lot to me. And it never, you know how you, things you hear, it's like it doesn't really register. Like it doesn't really, you don't really get the fullness of it until later on. It's like, yeah, that makes it more sense. Yeah, I'm, my mother used to say this always to me. She was a person that would always love to learn and, you know, education, learning things and reading and all this kind of stuff. She, she said, the more I know, the more I know that I don't know. And that's the truth when it comes to the things, the deep things of scripture and doctrine and of God as well. Soldier of Yahweh. I guarantee you, if you do not stay on the top of what they call the, the Dunning-Kruger Mount Stupid thing, you know, where the, when, when someone first starts getting into something, when they first start learning about something, they're, they start, you know, they start at the bottom and it's like the more and more they know, the more confident they get, the more. And so they get their, at first, the confidence level goes super high, sky high but they only know a little bit, but they think they know a lot. They think they know everything, but they only know a little bit, but their confidence is so high. I know it all. I know the truth. I know this and I know that. As long as you don't get that, they call that Mount Stupid, by the way. They, they call that Mount Stupid. As long as you don't get stuck up there, I think this, this happens to all of us, right? This happens to all of us. 
so if you're humble enough to say, hey, there's a lot more here than I think I, I think there's a lot more for me to learn about. I think there's more stuff here than what I originally thought. Maybe I need to learn more. And if you humble yourself and you say, hey, yeah, there's more here to learn. And you actually do learn more. And guess what? You're not going to stay on top of Mount Stupid anymore. You're going to come down. You're going to plummet. You're going to come down. Your, your confidence level is going to come right, way down. And it'll take years, perhaps even decades, to, to get more and more confidence up. You know, it, it, The confidence level will never reach the height that it, it used to be in, in, you know, in our Dunning-Kruger effect. So when you... I've said this to you last night, um, soldier of Yahweh. I'll say it again. Maybe it didn't, maybe you didn't hear it. Um, if there's one passage or maybe even just one or two passages, a couple passages throughout the scriptures that say things like this, little, little sound bites, little sound bites. And you don't see this Throughout all, if you don't see this as a common thread throughout all the scripture, in other words, if Isaiah doesn't talk about the tree of knowledge and good and evil, if 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 Ezekiel doesn't talk about the tree of knowledge and good and evil, if, if Moses in in his you know Exodus and Leviticus, if he doesn't talk about it, or if um, David doesn't talk about, it, if all these people, if Jesus didn't talk about it, then that should be a red flag. That should be a red flag. That should be a warning light on your dashboard going, warning, warning. Maybe this isn't what you think it is. It's either it's not important or you're misinterpreting it. Do not make a doctrine out of it. Unless you see a consistent a consistency of this doctrine throughout, throughout all of Scripture. Then you got a lot to go on. Otherwise, just nitpicking one little nugget of knowledge, you know, knowledge of good and evil over here. Well, where else do you read about it? Where? Is it consistent? Do we have it in the book of Joshua? You know, if, if not, then there very well could be a misinterpretation. You could be taking something and blowing it way out of proportion misinterpreting it and then seeing it in other books but it's not really there you see it but it's not there because you think because you're looking at it so much you're thinking about it so much you see things that are not really there you read into the text what's not really there you said there would be less killing less GMOs if it, if it wasn't for Adam and Eve well okay uh, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. Uh, if Adam and Eve were actually the, the very first human beings, if we're all descendants from Adam and Eve, then yeah, you're right. 100% right. If it, were, if it wasn't for Adam and Eve, there would be less uh, killing <laughs> because nobody would be alive in the first place. Uh, however, I don't believe that Adam and Eve, don't blame your forefathers. Honor your forefathers. If indeed Adam and Eve is your forefather. Because I do not believe the sins of the father, including the punishment leads, leads is inherited to the son. Okay, so now you just shot yourself in the foot. You just said, so, this, this sentence right here goes against everything that you just said. I believe it's practiced by the son when, he, when he's only a toddler. You can read... This on tomorrow's, okay, yeah, which I am. I truly don't know how else to explain this with someone thinking I'm taking common Christian narrative that the sin and punishment of the parent is given to the kid. Well, if you think that we all die because Adam and Eve died, then that's what you're saying. It sounds to me like you've got like an oxymoron going on. You're saying, yeah, no. Yeah, and no at the same, yeah, but no, but yeah, but no. It's, that's what it sounds like you're saying here. I wanted to explain in a sense so you can see where I'm coming from. Thank you for your answers. I appreciate them. Shalom. Well, thank you for your comment. Appreciate that.
Okay. Yes, so we spoke about this, spoke about original sin, spoke about Marcion a lot. And lots of lots of stuff here we covered tonight. If you haven't already, please leave a like, please subscribe, follow. All right. All right, then. All right, all right. Okay, so tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow's Friday. We are um, going to do basically what we're doing tonight. Uh, tomorrow, Saturday, we're going to talk about humility and the importance of humility. Go through the scriptures, uh, talking about uh, how uh, the examples that we have and, and the, um, the commandments and, and the, the word of God that we got about humility there. On uh, next week, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Who, who is the Holy Spirit, or what is the Holy Spirit, and um, go through the scriptures in regards to that as well. Everything from Genesis all the way through. Uh, talking about the, I want to talk about the Kundalini spirit as well. Talk about the Charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, tongue talking, uh, gifts of the Spirit, how to receive the Holy Spirit. Being born of the Spirit, what does that mean? All this kind of stuff we'll talk about uh, next week. It'll be another special series on the Holy Spirit, so make sure you're joining if that interests you. By the way, if any of this stuff interests you, talking about the things of God, the things of Scripture, and all this kind of stuff, make sure that you're subscribed, make sure you're following, make sure you leave a like. Hello says, humility sounds great, awesome, yes. Yes, it's on my heart. It's been on my heart for several several days to talk about humility on Saturday. Okay, yeah. I, I, I personally believe that the more humility there is in the world, the better it'll be. The more humility there is, the more heaven we'll, we'll have on earth. I really do believe that. Okay, all right. So let's... Soldier of Yahweh is enmity, which God said he gave Adam and Eve. It hurts. That Again, that's not exactly what it says, Soldier of Yahweh. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So there's two, only two. We got the serpent and the woman. The serpent and the woman. Is that a curse? I would say if it's a curse to anything, it might be a curse to the serpent. You could say it's a blessing because you don't want to be friends with the devil, <laughs> right? Or Eve, I should say. Again, this is not talking about you and I. This is talking about the devil and Eve, 
period. That's it. It doesn't say, again, critical thinking. What does it say? What does it not say? It says, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman. It does not say, I will put enmity between you and all of her descendants. And between your seed and her seed. Okay. And you notice here the, the word seed is in um it's it's capitalized as the translators believe this is talking about Jesus, which I think this is correct. Uh this is talking about Jesus. Between her between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. So it's talking about one person. He shall bruise, not all of them, but he shall bruise your head. And that's what Jesus did, right? Didn't Jesus bruise the head of the serpent? Definitely. And you shall bruise, you shall bruise his heel. So again, the figure of speech, striking at the heel. Yes, the devil did strike at the heel of Jesus, so to speak. But again, this, this has nothing to do with original sin. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is a prophecy about Jesus. Soldier of Yahweh, does it not say because they have sinned, he will put enmity between her seed and his seed? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say because they have sinned. Okay? This is a prophecy. He's speaking to the, he's speaking to the serpent here. Not speaking to you or I. He's, this is a prophecy. Basically striking fear in, into the serpent. Hey, serpent, there's a time coming when her seed, um, him, you know him, he will come and he will, bruise, he will bruise your head. You will bruise his heel or you will strike his heel. In other words, you're going to do him a little bit of damage, but he's going to do much, much more damage. You're going to strike his heel, the bottom part. You're, he's going to crush your head. No, no, it doesn't say. What you think it says, and again, even if it did, even if it, even if it said because it doesn't make sense. I mean, oh, Adam and Eve sinned, therefore, uh, because they sinned, then you are going to strike their heel, and 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 you're going to strike his heel, the Messiah. And the Messiah will strike, will crush your head. I mean, you can read into it. Again, you can read into it what, it, what you think. It, it. You can read into a lot of different things, but this is it's not what it explicitly says. It's like when he said to the woman, you know, that basically the man will rule over you. I don't think that was a curse. Okay? I think that was basically God... See, in the beginning, this is getting off topic, I know. In the beginning, we got Adam who listened to Eve, submitted to Eve. Whereas Eve should have been submitted to Adam according to Genesis, according to the Holy Scriptures. Eve should have been submitted to Adam, and thus Adam should have said, this is what the Lord God says, because God spoke to Adam, not to Eve. Until now, until in Genesis chapter 3, then God spoke to Eve after the fact but not before. God gave the Torah to Adam, not to Eve. So it was Adam's responsibility. It was Adam's responsibility. Adam was the one who was tasked with the responsibility. So, I mean, you can read a lot of things in it that it doesn't say. And I understand, soldier of Yahweh, it sounds very much like you have, you have heard the corrupt Christian narrative about all this stuff. I'm here to say, perhaps that's wrong. Let's not, let's not read into it what it doesn't say. Let's not be biased in what it, what it says or what it doesn't say. Thank you, Soldier of Yahweh. Flo says, so I can let my friend Donna know. Yes, please do. Yes. Soldier of Yahweh says, Jesus called a group of men, children of, de children of the devil. That's only if you 
only if the Gospel of John chapter 8 is historic, which most people believe it's not. I think it's a good chance it wasn't historic. Okay? Again, if this is true, why didn't Mark read, uh, report it, or Luke report it, or John, or um, Matthew report it, or Paul report it, or and all these other things? Uh, the Gospel of John. Did you listen to the series? If you did, I don't. You may be. You may not say what you just said here. If you listen to that John series, Jesus called a group of a group of men, children of the devil. Wouldn't they be the seed of God? Wouldn't they be the seed that God spoke about in Genesis? No, 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 not at all. Because I know you said it's talking about Jesus, this seed, but this seed to me is offspring. Okay, um, I, I, I'm not going to go on too much here, soldier of Yahweh, but if it just left it as seed alone, then you can, then you can say, okay, is it talking about one or is it talking about many? Okay. But the very fact that it, it's, it, it specifies that it's talking about one and not many, that, that should tell you what it means. That should tell you. Now, in John chapter 8, that may not be even historical at all. That may not be even true at all that Jesus ever said that. So if it's not true, why, again, why stake, again, you're doing exactly what I said the past couple of, if you take one little thing, you run with it. If this is something that we see throughout all of Scripture, then you can say, oh, okay, then we, you know, Even if it's all true. So first things first, it may not be true. So make sure we keep that in mind. It may not be true at all. Jesus may not have said that. But let's just say he did. Just for the sake of conversation, just for the sake of talking about it. Let's just say he did, that he did, he did actually say that. Well, he admitted that they were all children of Abraham. Okay? Which... He, he had, at first he said, if you're the children of Abraham, you wouldn't do what, you, what you're doing. You wouldn't say what you're saying, but you're of your, of your father, the, the devil. So he spoke this, if it's true, he spoke it to one little group of people one time in his life, in all of his life, in all of his life, one little group of people once. And it may have been just a couple people. It may have been just two. It may have been four. I don't know. It doesn't tell us how many. It may have been 20. I don't know. It doesn't tell us how many. All we know is this one group of people. That's all we know. Now, is it possible that some of these people would be sons of the devil? Absolutely. Now, does that mean that they were physically the sons of the devil? No, of course not. That means that they were spiritually the sons of the devil. Because there's no way you can be the son of Abraham and the son of the devil at the same time. In the same way, you can be physically the son of Abraham and spiritually the son of the devil in a sense. We know about this because in the Tanakh, it talks about the sons of Belial, which is the same thing. Okay? Belial, the devil, is the same thing. So it talks about some people who are the sons of the devil in the Tanakh, which obviously implies, if you, if, again, I don't want to go into another whole thing here, another whole study, but look it up, soldier of Yahweh. If you look it up, again, if you use a little bit of critical thinking skills, you will see it talks about, the, you know, this person was a son of, the, of, of Belial, or this, this guy, these guys were the sons of, of Belial, which obviously implies the other people weren't. Not everybody's a child of the, de the devil. And you can't be a child of the devil and a child of God at the same time. Yeah, you've really been bamboozled by this uh, original sin doctrine, unfortunately. Time to unlearn that. Okay, what I'm going to do here, um, because we've been talking about critical thinking quite a bit recently, I'm going to skip over the fallacy part. We'll get right to the actual uh, critical thinking quiz. Critical thinking quiz. Now, for those of you who like the word, word quizzes as opposed to number quizzes, this is for you.
The same four letter word can be added to each of the following words to make a new word or a common phrase. What is the word? Bound, proof, tree, less, bird. So we're looking for a four letter word that can be added to each of the following words to make a new word or a common phrase. What is the word? Give you guys a couple minutes. Seek the Lord says seed. Anybody else want to take a shot at this? same four letter word can be added to each of the following words to make a new word or a common phrase what is the word
Soldier of Yahweh said, I was going to say house, but it isn't a four letter word. What four letter word can we use here? Elementos is thinking. So, I think this four letter word that is, that is, that we're looking for here can be added to a couple of these to make a compound word. And this four letter word can also be like a separate word. So that's why it says a new word or a common phrase. One, two, king says tree limb. I think limb will go with the other ones too. John says, can we have an, the number problem again? Okay. Sean likes the numbers. Soldier says, is it the word home? I'll let you guys know. One, uh, one more minute here. Just give you guys a little bit more time. One more minute. Elemental says head, wood, <laughs> soldier of Yahweh, head proof. There you go.
Okay. Okay. I'll put the answer in here. Change that a little bit. Answer is rain. Rain. Rain bound proof, rain proof, rain tree, rain less, or rain bird. That was a little bit, that was a tough one, wasn't it? That was a tough one. You guys did an amazing job at, at uh, working it here, guessing. That was a tough one, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, guys. Rain, yes, rain, rain. Who did, who did, who did think, right? Word rain. All right, all right, all right. Just one, one little thing here. Uh, let's see, Soldier of Yahweh says, enmity means hostility. And we've all been hostile since God gave this t to the serpent and Eve's seed. That, that's not true, Soldier of Yahweh. Uh, so enmity can mean hostility. It can also mean hatred. It's basically uh, to be opposed to, a hatred. Uh, this is what it means. And it says, it doesn't say hatred to everybody. It says hatred between two people. Two people. Between the devil and Eve. Hatred between the devil and Eve. Which is a good thing. You don't want them to be lovers, okay? You don't want Eve to love the devil. You don't want the devil to love Eve, okay? You want, it's like you put enmity between light and darkness. Because you don't want to have light. Felt You don't. Everybody hates something. To hate what is good is good. Or excuse me. To hate what is evil is good. To love what is good is good. So enmity between the, e between the woman and the devil is good. Okay? For the, for the, because the opposite would be for, for, for Eve to love the devil. And that would not be good. So once again, soldier of Yahweh, you're reading into it what's not there. It's just not, not there at all and not true. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up with that. We're going to wrap it up with that. You guys did an awesome job. I know you guys are, your head, <laughs> I, could, I could hear the gears turning. So good job, everyone. Yeah, uh, uh, Ch Chad Wantra King says, good job, everyone. I agree. Good job, everyone, for sure. Yes. All right. Flo says, seriously, that's something I would never have even guessed. When would I? When would I ever use those words? Who makes this stuff up? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, this is from a book called Match Wits with Mensa. This is actually that's that's from the book Match Wits with Mensa. Yeah, some of these words are words that you never think of, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Sean says awesome teaching tonight, Christopher. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. And Randy says, thank you as always. Thank you, Randy. Blessings, blessings to you. Chada One True King says, Kalamantos is having way too much fun. Way too much fun, okay? So, all right. And Seek the Lord says, thank you, Brother Christopher. God bless you and everyone here richly and abundantly. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Seek the Lord. God bless you even more. See you tomorrow.
Sean says, Shalom. Shalom, Sean. Blessings, blessings, and peaceful, peaceful night. Flo says, thanks, Christopher. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Flo. You too. Wonderful, peaceful night. Blessings, soldier of Yahweh. All right. John and Wonder King, thank you for your time. Christopher, thank you. John and Wonder King, appreciate you. Awesome. Daisy Fields, good to see you back. It's been a while. Hope all is well with you. Says, good evening. Good evening. Blessings. Shalom. We're just signing off here. We'll be back again tomorrow, Lord willing. Same time, same place. And again, looking forward to Shabbat with a live band, 2 p.m. Eastern. 2 p.m. Eastern, live band. And then we're going to be talking about humility, going through the scriptures, all that kind of stuff. Next week, talking about the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit next week. Talking about all about everything. We're going to start with Genesis, and we're going to go all the way. Well, I don't know if we can cover everything, but we're going to cover a lot, put it that way. It's going to be the most exhaustive series of the Holy Spirit that I know of. Daisy Fields says, been a while, brother. Yes, it has been a while. Hope all is well with you. Yeah, good to see you. All right. So I'll see you guys again tomorrow. As always, keep on keeping on. Keep on pressing in. Keep on calling on him, and he will show you great and mighty things. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Okay, guys. Love you guys. As always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you wonderful, wonderful, Shalom. Amen. Amen. See you guys tomorrow.